welcome in this session we're going to continue our discussion we had in the last video um, about uh, how do we deal with uncertainty in field development so in the last lecture we learned that how do we quantify and how, how do we express uncertainty in parameters using discrete probability distribution and continuous probability distributions so now we're going to do our, our the objective of our lecture is how to handle on certain parameters in our calculations. Okay. How do we handle these uncertain parameters in our field development calculation? And here first we have to make a distinction. So let's say we have a function that depends on two parameters x and y. And this function essentially can be any process. It could be a reservoir simulation, can be simply an Excel sheet calculation, production profile estimation, or can even be a working process that we have in a company. It can be a cost estimation that I have to send some information to a, uh, to a department and then get back from them the result. But essentially here we have two parameters to make it simple, X and Y, that affect this calculation. And then here I can obtain can be a single parameter set or can be other things. Okay, can be a parameter y. This this uh, function can give one or can give several uh, outputs. So we say there are two types of calculation that we can make here. One is a deterministic calculation. Okay, and in a deterministic calculation the x and y they have a unique value and they are known okay, and in this case is simply what we have been doing so far we assume that this value is the unique value that the variable has and simply use it for my calculation so then I have another type of calculation that is called stochastic or prob probabilistic calculation. And in this case, X and Y have a probabilistic distribution associated. Okay? And in this case, the calculation won't be deterministic anymore because the result won't be one unique value. Actually, I can have a, a, a series of values for X and, and W. So one approach that we can deal, how we can deal with, uh, with uncertainty, a bit simplistic, can be Let's, let's do for that, let's say we have a function, let's make it even simpler. We have a function, 1D function, x, okay. and we say that this function actually has the following behavior, fx. But we actually don't know that behavior is unknown, okay, but this is the actual behavior. So the, the approach we use um, to determine uh, to to see how the how the how the function looks like with a distribution of x. Let's say now that my x is plotted here, in a chart below, that the x actually has is normally or uh, let's say is normally distributed, okay, within a range. This is a PDF of x. Okay, so one approach can be simply to take samples. So I come here and I create a series of samples, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and then I evaluate the function on those samples. Okay, so this will be f1, this will be f2, this will be f3, 
and this will be f4. Okay, so let's let's say we so the approach is to uh, create samples. The next step is to evaluate the function at the samples. And the next step I have is um, is actually I want to perform a frequency analysis on the results because remember I in in this case I have x and y they have a distribution they have a frequency a probability distribution so with the results I can apply also um, frequency analysis and I can find the probability distribution of the result okay, so the, here the third step is to calculate the PDF and CDF of the results. Okay. Create samples, evaluate and function at samples and calculate the PDF and CDF of the results. Okay, so very, very simple approach. Uh, of course, there are few complexities. For example, in this function, we know that X has values from this range to this range, but also has a higher likelihood to have values close to this part because the probability is higher. So in that case, actually also it makes sense maybe to take more samples around here than to take less samples in this region. Okay, so may, let's put that comment here. More samples are required here and here has required less samples. Okay, so there is one question to say how many samples do we need to to um, okay we we have this question about how many samples are actually needed and the other question is how to take the samples how to generate the samples Okay. And one approach you might say, well, I for the first question, okay, to address this first question, I have to uh, increase the number of samples and see how the results change. For example, and we are talking here, the results are the PDF and the CDF. So for example, let's say that we have, this is a result variable. Okay, and we have a distribution that this one was made for, let's say, 100 samples. Okay, then I repeat, I, I create more samples, for example, with 500 and then I end up with a distribution that is actually like that for 500 samples and then I repeat even more and then I have a distribution with more samples and then I find for example a distribution that looks something like that this will be for a thousand samples and what we're looking at here is the PDF so you can say from this example that well, between 100 and 500, the distribution changed dramatically. Okay, but then when I changed between 500 and 1000, actually they were uh, relatively close. Okay, so I can say here that for this case, it seems uh, 500 samples is enough. Okay, that means that you achieved convergence using um, using using 500 samples and this is something I have to do for most of these methods that are based on sampling okay I have to be a, be able to determine how many samples I need I increase the number of samples and I see if there is any variation if there are no significant variation then I can simply uh, stop okay so another way I can compare so I, instead of comparing the complete CDF, PDF, I can comp I compare the CDF. 
Okay, for example, I have here is my this is will be for a thousand samples. This will be for a hundred samples. Okay, and then you have maybe one that is for 500 samples. So actually I don't have to compare the whole curve, but I can put some numbers here. I can put some, some numbers, let's say one at 10%, um, okay, at 0.1. 0 0.5 and maybe 0 0.9. I create a few on a, some places and then I see the spread. You see here there is some spread between 100 and 1000 samples and also the same thing here. Okay, and I simply repeat calculations until this spread between those becomes small. Okay, and small I have to have defined some criteria what does it mean to be small. Sometimes this can be something 5% from the previous difference, can be 10%, can be 3%, 1%, you define how strict you want to be. So that was the first problem, okay, how many samples are needed, and I hope you got an idea how that's done. Okay, but how do you generate the samples? So that's the second approach that we are going to deal with. And here there are two methods that we're going to cover. So one is the Monte Carlo. And the other one is the Latin hypercube sampling. Okay. Essentially samples, I, I could think also in a way if we were looking at the two-dimensional function. So let's before that let's look at the brute force approach. Brute force sampling. So in brute force sampling assume that we have a function called Z and that depends on two variables X and Y and this function maybe looks something like this. So you could feel that a good way to perform this sampling could be to simply make some sort of a grid. Okay, you create some parameters in the x-axis you create some samples in the y-axis and simply then you make an element-wise combination between the two. Okay, in this case you have end up with all of these values that you need to evaluate. Okay, it's an element-wise combination so you have a certain number of points in x and you have a certain number of points in y so the end total will be nx times ny. Okay, and this looks uh, very, very good, but also we have here an issue that if, for example, like what we discussed before with x, okay, if we have some probability distribution for x, this is not really taken care of here because I'm not densifying where I might need more, more, uh, more elements, where I might need more samples. Okay, so for example, here we can say that the x has distribution like that. This is the um, PDF and Y also the same thing. Okay, so we, you see here also well, I might not need to put such a uniform grid but I actually need to sample more from here. Let's lower that a bit. Okay. And the other problem that this approach has is that it is impractical for large number of variables. Okay, or variables yeah, and samples. You could imagine that if we have only two variables, but if we decide to have a thousand in each one, then we need a, a one million evaluation. Okay, or if you have 10 only on each, but then you have 10 variables, then this will be a large number. Okay, 10 to the power of 10. So these uh, methods, Monte Carlo and Latin Hypercube, they're actually 
the, their idea is to try to make an efficient sample, an efficient sampling. An efficient sampling means uh, less number of samples to achieve convergence. Okay, and convergence in this context we are saying is this process that we defined before that you want the results to have the same distribution when you increase the number of samples. Okay, so you want to achieve convergence with a relatively small number of samples. Okay, so let's just jump right into. So we have the Monte Carlo method. In the reference material that I uploaded, um, uh, is, is, uh, there is a section of the book from uh, uh, Bradwell and uh, Beck. And in this book, they describe a bit, there is a snippet describing uh, the origin of this method. And essentially was used for many people, by many people before. But the formal version of the method, more mathematically uh, presented, it was presented in, um, I think it was 49, by these two guys in a paper, uh, Metropolis and Ulam, who they were working in the laboratory at Los Alamos, and they were working on nuclear research. So the, the, essence, the essence of the method is, um, so let's say we have three parameters, x, y, and z. Again, and we are going to go with the CDF. Okay. X, Y, and Z. And each one they have their associated CDF. Might be discrete, might be continuous, I don't know, but it is a CDF. And this enters into one simulation process that depends on x, y, and z. And remember, it might depend on other parameters, but these other parameters won't be uh, uncertain. And then I obtain my results that could be my variable called w that we defined before, or my variable called, for example, k. Okay. So the, the process to take the samples are, the first one is to a, um, a and uh, one one way to do it is that I pick for each. This will be done for each variable. For each variable, I have to pick a, a number, a random number between zero and one, and I have very efficient algorithms to 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 be able to generate a random number between 0 and 1 and then with this number I enter the CDF and read the value of the variable okay actually this will be 0.1 and this will be step 1.1 and 1.2 So if we see how that looks graphically, if we have our CDF and we have our variable x, for example, okay, we come here with our number between zero and one. These are the two extremes. And then I pick a random number and I read my value of x star. Okay, that is done for each variable. And then the second step is simply to uh, evaluate the function perform a simulation okay. and then the third step is to repeat many times steps one and two okay. That means I pick for each variable, I pick a random number between zero and one. Let's say here will be here and here gives me a higher number, here gives a lower number. Okay, then I gather all of those samples. Gather all of those samples, perform a simulation with the samples. Okay. 
repeat many times the steps from 1 to 2 okay and then for number 4 is what the step that we already had is that perform a frequency analysis on the results okay this is to determine the PDF and the CDF okay so this is relying on the fact that I take a a random number on the CDF okay, and this number I can I essentially I will be picking a lot of numbers no matter what between 0 and 1 but when I use this curve actually because they are uniform actually they are going to give me a distribution which is not uniform in X okay so for example if I put here uh, the samples they are going to be to be because they are random samples so you're going to end up having more a lot of uniform samples here so when they come to the curve actually you see that you have you're going to have concentrated some samples in some region where there is the highest probability okay, you're going to have, have less samples concentrated in the area where you have low probability and in this case also that you have low probability you have samples concentrated where the function where the um, the CDF is uh, highest uh, highest probability Okay, so that's essentially the Monte Carlo method, the way we are going to be using it. And then we have a Latin hypercube, which is a slightly more difficult. Okay, in Latin hypercube sampling, also we abbreviated LHS. Okay, so the first step is this is for each variable. Well, first, before that, before we do for each variable, so we define a number of samples n. Okay, beforehand, I already know how many samples I'm going to have. And for each variable, the first step is to subdivide the cumulative frequency, cumulative probability in n intervals okay, that means that I have, let's say for example for my x that I showed before you have the CDF and you have my x and then the equation, the function looks something like that Okay, between zero and this will be one. Okay. So I simply let's say for for our example n equal four for intervals. So I divide this this in four. Well, here is half, half, and half. Okay, so these are my four intervals. One, two, three, four. And this will be the same. So th this typically is made equally spaced. Okay, step 1.2 is that I uh, pick a random number in the interval. And this is a bit different from the Monte Carlo in which I was picking a random number within, within the whole interval, 0 to 1. And here I'm picking a number only from that interval. Okay, only in that interval. I take for example here I will say well the random generator gave me a number here the random gave me a number here this one gave me a number here and that one gave me a number here okay so here I will have my x1 x2 x3 and x4 okay then at this stage I'm going to have let's say for the three uh, cases that I have x1 x2 x3 and x4 Okay, pick a random sorry pick a random number in the interval and then I have to uh, find the corresponding value of the variable value of the variable 
Okay, in our case, we will have, so then x1, x2, x3, and x4. We have one vector, then we have one for y1, y2, y3, y4. And we have z1, z2, z3, z4. Now the step 1.3, that I'm still doing this for every parameter, okay, for every variable. is to shuffle each vector, shuffle, shuffle randomly. The sample vector. Okay, so maybe I will end up with uh, x3, x1, x4, x2. Maybe I end up with uh, y, 1, y3, y4, y2, and maybe I end up with z3, z2, z1, z4. For example, okay, I shuffle randomly the sample vector vectors, and I will do that for all of them. Okay, and then step two is to perform simulations. for all samples, for samples in the, in the variables, for sample variables that are in the same row. Okay, for example, I come here and I pick all of these that are on the same row and I perform a simulation with that combination. Then I perform a simulation with that and uh, with that and with that. So this will be simulation one, simulation two, simulation three, simulation four. And then the rest is the same. So the rest is simply perform a frequency analysis on the results. And then from here I obtain the CDF and the PDF. And then the next step is to make a convergence analysis that uh, if the number of samples is enough or not. One uh, advantage that the Latin uh, hypercube sampling has with uh, con compared to Monte Carlo is that in Monte Carlo I'm, I'm sampling and it could be that because it's random I could be that I sample many times with values that are very very close. In this case I'm dividing that in beans and I'm sampling only one within each interval. So I'm not allowed to be jumping and picking for example two from the same interval. So that's why in, in, in theory it should take you less iterations if you use Latin Hypercube than if you use Monte Carlo. It's a more ordered or is a more organized way of taking my samples. I'm not allowing here to take two samples from the same interval, I'm allowing just to take one. So that's the end of the lecture, the next step will be to do an, an example. Thank you.